Hello and welcome back to Calculus 1 Saturday edition. <laughs> this is uh, section 3.1 uh, with elements of 2.1, right? Um, on introduction to derivative. So we are starting the, the second part of our calculus uh, course. Uh, calculus as a study of motion, study of change. We said consists of three parts, limits, derivatives, and integrals. And all three are studied as concepts in Calc 1 and then expanded on in Calc 2 and Calc 3. So that you can use them in differential equation and other courses that are uh, actually very useful. Well, calculus on its own can be very useful, but it's differential equation where your, your, your physics and engineering and everything else including economics and um, understanding the world around actually is, you know. So you are technically preparing yourself to take that course. And um, the, the, the lecture today uh, is going to introduce this, uh, this new concept. And we are going to see uh, calculus at its full might uh, today because uh, it will show uh, the way you uh, change functions and, and uh, understand the, the change. So we're going to start with this uh, idea that uh, the world around us and the different concepts that we, that we have, that we observe, some of those concepts uh, are constant and some of those concepts change with time. Uh, they don't have to change with time, but most of them, uh, we are doing the... Oh, my, my headphones. So most of the time we are observing the, we are, we are observing the change. So what I want to uh, talk about first is, uh, for instance, the height of the person. Right. You know that from the, the day you were born and, you know, you're a your couple of inches uh, long uh, into, into adulthood, uh, you, you grow. Right. And it doesn't matter, you know, at some point you are going to hit uh, two feet tall and then three feet tall and then, you know, four feet tall, whatever. So, so it, gradually, it gradually goes over, over time. And... Um, in case of the um, everyday life, you also change your height. You are tallest for the day when you wake up in the morning, and then you are shortest for that day when you go to bed. Because, uh, you know, after being unconscious for, for a couple of hours, you're in a horizontal position, you're, you're, you stretch out. Your joints stretch out, your, your body relaxes, and you are taller uh, when you when you wake up, uh, then when you when you went to bed, and I'm not talking about the growth growth spurt or anything like that. I'm just talking about the joints stretching out. Now, when you when you become vertical in the morning, meaning you 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 got up out of bed and you're walking around, your body weight slightly compresses on the joints, and you are a fraction fraction tiny fraction of an inch shorter uh, as you as you go through the day. So that's a very subtle change, and we can actually compute that using calculus. Um, the same thing in the car, right? Um, so we still have these ancient vehicles that are using, uh, you know, that are working on a principle of exploding dead plants and animals in the engine block to propel us from point A to point B. Uh, it is really silly to, to say it that way, but that's where the state of technology is until we got Teslas, you know, driving around. So think about that, that you, you know, you, you pull out of ground the, the, the oil, which is, which is the carcasses of, of dead plants and, right, and trees and, and, and animals, and you, you refine that into gasoline, and then the gasoline is injected into the engine and uh, ignited by the spark plug, creates a little expo explosion which pushes the piston and then the engineering time that just right to turn the, the shaft that has the wheels attached to it through gearboxes and everything else. And then the car moves. 
it's a really silly concept, but it works. And, you know, almost every car out there works that way. And it's been working like that for 150, 150 years, right? So we're just making it shinier, right? And, and, and put the better... Uh, better paint on it and then then some people put uh, you know uh, rims and tires that are more expensive than the car itself on, on that car and drive it around thinking they're cool um, so that's you know that's all that we do silly things as, as people but thinking about the concept is you drive that car and, and you're using up that gas uh, you plus the car in terms of the weight constantly goes down it changes Right, it changes, and it's dropping uh, as you are uh, going uh, forward because you are uh, using your um, the gas has is is being used is being converted from from its state right so material state into um, energy and uh, exhaust and and heat and um, and that's another thing that is terrible about the cars of how inefficient the cars are about 25 to 27 percent efficiency from the fuel you you put in which is also not that you know strong of a fuel so when you take a look at the at the car it's just just one huge terrible mess um if you if you own any kind of gas car i don't care if it's you know truck or or a supercar um it's just in terms of efficiency it's it's, it's a really terrible thing to have you know you, you pay for 100% of your gas <laughs> at the pump, but you only use about 25% of it to drive around and run your air conditioning and music and everything in the car, lights, right? Uh, and the 75% is wasted. So every time you, you fill the tank for 40 bucks, uh, 30, is, is, 30 is wasted into heat and, and noise and, and exhaust. Um, where if you have... Tesla, for instance, um, your efficiency is 97 to, to 99%, depending on the driving conditions. In which case, almost 100% of your electric bill that you use to charge the car is actually used for, um, for what you're supposed to. Um, there is a reason why those cars are the best cars that exist on the planet and uh, why it's so successful. Uh, I see a message. Give me a second. Intro to... Oh, okay. Um, I did ask before that if you are, if you want to chat with me, please use the uh, YouTube chat because I don't see the chat for Zoom unless I click on it. And I also don't want it to be the part of the, the stream. Please use the chat in, in, in YouTube. Okay, derivative. So we have the um, we have that. Okay, cool. Now uh, I am going to uh, set some um, uh, do the graph and, and, and do some some walking uh, walking around to see how this concept is going to, to work out. So we're going to go and set up. Uh, we can do this with any type of a function. Again, I can put exponential here. I can put logarithmic, trigonometric. It doesn't matter. You have some kind of function because the concept is going to be explained on f of x, which means literally any function you want to plug in, go ahead, and the concept will work the same way. So um, we can uh, we can do um, any any function. Uh, how about we go with, um, well, actually, we need a nice curve so we can actually see. Let's do, let's do something like this. Let's, let's use the exponential, but a, a slower rising exponential function. So how about something like that? Usually exponential function would, would grow much faster. Oh, I think that the tablet already started overheating. Come on. Is it? Yeah. I got to go get the heating pad. I'll be back in a second. So draw this, and then we are going to have the X and Y axis, and we are going to have a point of interest uh, that we are going to 
uh, or two points actually. So we'll look at two points like this, and then there will be motion between those two points. All oh, right, <clears throat> I'm literally using ice packs <laughs> in a sleeve to cool this down. Uh, I could, I don't know if I can move it. Oh, I can move it all the way up here. Uh, is this better with Zoom thing? Um, that's I would the need to wait till the YouTube stream updates. Like to oh yeah, uh, the highest. Uh, that's the highest I can go, uh, and I can't put it lower because then my palm of the hand hits. That's why my my uh, taskbar is on the top of the screen and everything because I am writing on the tablet, and when I rest my hand, I start opening programs and changing things. So everything has to be on top. That looks good now. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so let's take a look at this uh, situation where I have um, some function f of x, and I am going to uh, come up with uh, these uh, two points, uh, usually labeled uh, p and q, but you can use a and b. You can literally use any any letters you you want. Uh, I'm going to have so p and q and those two will be from a and b points on the now this one will actually later on turn to 2x but let's let's just do this and what's going to happen now is i'm going to uh, let b approach a so b goes to a that's the that's the deal here. So this Q will start traveling down this down this line into you can say Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 going towards P and every time when this Q physically moves along the line because this B Right, moved along the x-axis going closer to, to A, it creates the new line which has a slope, what we would call, uh, sec well, the line will be called secant line, and the slope will be called the, the M secant, which is the, and the secant means uh, to cut. So the uh, the change here is uh, going to to measure using we will measure the change using a basic um, uh, algebra where we just use a good old um, slope of the slope of the line 
uh, that you that you guys learned in um, in basic algebra course. So what I'm going to to have here is that if you, you remember the formula that the slope was um, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now for for my m secant, actually I'm going to change this into blue to be color coded to the line it belongs to, um, to match the line it belongs to. So I'm going to say m secant is equal to, and now you see that it, it, this is f of b, which is the y value for the b point, minus f of a, which is the y value for a point, divided by b minus a. This is the m secant. And this is uh, just your good old algebra slope. There's no calculus here. And this one calculates the average change, actually. So you can use this immediately to calculate the average, average change. And now we're going to upgrade this formula a couple of times. I'm going to... Um, do the uh, um, let me put M. There we go. So uh, I'm going to upgrade this a couple of times. First off, uh, I'm going to replace um, this concept of uh, of B with X, which is the variable, because remember B is the point. Right, B is the point, and uh, it's immovable. Once, once you say B is equal to 3, there is no motion there. B is 3, and, and you're done, right? But if you are to say that that's X, right, then you start getting the motion, the M secant becomes F of X minus F of A, divided by x minus a. And now we can get rid of the, the, the top one, which is technically algebra, and have the first one in the calculus where x is allowed, uh, where x allows for motion, for change. So as this point b moves to the left and to the left and to the left and to the left, as it keeps taking different values for x, we can see that it's changing, and that in fact changes the, the, the y value, and that in fact changes the slope of the uh, secant line, which is the line that simply connects uh, these two uh, points, p and, and q, or q1 or q2, and so on. So the whole concept here is very simple. You have two points that live on the line, and then one of those two points starts moving towards the other, and, um, you know, connecting them with a straight line, uh, which is M secant, gives you the line that um, is called the secant line. And its slope is given by the formula, which we derived using basic algebra, actually. Now, none of this stuff should be new, other than probably notation that you did not think of probably in this way. But the new thing kicks in when you realize that you have a real problem when these two functions, uh, these two points uh, combine into a single point. Then you see the issue, right? Because once they are both at A, your denominator becomes what? A minus A, right? And that's a zero. And you are not allowed to divide by zero. But as soon as the point Q passes P, and Q is to the left of P, everything is good again, right? So it was great before Q reached P. It's great after Q passes P. We only have issue at P. But we also see that these lines keep changing their slope and they're changing that gradually 
going towards some value of p right, uh, for some value of slope at p and it's the only one that we cannot compute using algebra and what we have learned before so this is where this is the the, the, the point at which calculus and limits have to kick in with the blue formula I am able to calculate 100% of all slopes, and that's infinitely many slopes, around point P, well, at point P, but when the Q is around point P. And that sounds like that limit thing we, we talked about. Remember when I said that limits compute infinitely many Y values around the point except at the point? And then many of those theorems and definitions had... Uh, the function exists uh, uh, on the interval around A, except possibly at A. That's that concept, right? The function can be computed at every point. Well, I mean, this, this function, the blue function, can be computed at every point, except when Q hits P and they become the same point. Because in the denominator, you would have A minus A, and the calculation for from uh, algebra would fail because you can't divide by zero. But do not despair, right? Because calculus and limits are going to kick in and say, that's okay. We have infinitely many answers around that point. So we're just going to guess exactly <laughs> what the, the slope is when these two points collide and when these two points uh, are not able to give us answer using algebra. So we get into this state like this, the red line, which is a special line known as tangent line. And so red line is called tangent line and it has nothing to do with tangent function i mean tangent function has tangent lines and sine function has tangent lines and exponential function has tangent lines so all of the functions have tangent lines and i'll like i'll explain what those are but the red line is the tangent line and i just want to make it clear now that it's not a tangent function from um from your uh trig so now, what is this line um, and why is this line the main focus and the most important line of Calculus 1? Wow, we're actually looking at the concept that it's the most important concept in the, in the whole course. So tangent line shows the instantaneous change of a function at the point where you computed a tangent line. It doesn't sound much to you when I say it that way until you realize that tangent line answers are your speedometer on a car. And there are thousands of examples around you. So what is the speedometer measuring? It measures change of speed, uh, sorry, it measures change of distance in, in time, which is called speed. It measures speed. As soon as you touch the gas pedal or the brake pedal, it instantly changes up or down, depending which, which pedal you pushed. So that speedometer that you have in a car is a collection of tangent line answers, the slopes of tangent line. Now, we're going to understand that from a perspective now, a different, I'll, I'll go there, but let's first define this and, uh, and say what the tangent line is. So red line is called tangent line. Tangent line is a linear line
which is which is perpendicular to the curvature of f of x at point x equals a and gives us <coughs> sorry <coughs> so it gives us instantaneous rate of change tangent line is computed later right now we are focusing on the slope of the tangent line which gives us instantaneous rate of change and um, I should have said and slope of the tangent line. Ah. Yeah. I, I have to insert that because this is the way the way I, I phrased it is actually really bad. So let's let's move this. I have to fix this. And the slope. of the tangent line okay gives us instantaneous rate of change there we go much better so now i show that that slope of the tangent line is going to be the limit as x goes to a for f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a this is the same blue formula right here this is this is your blue formula i did not change the formula i added the limit I added limit to say that I am computing this one particular line, the red line on the graph. And that line, that red line is uh, a special line. It's different than, uh, than other lines. That line is this, uh, the tangent line is the line that will later on measure technically everything that we, we want to know about sciences <laughs> all right so let's compute compute the slope of the tangent line in the future just tl for y equals x squared minus 3x plus 1 at x equals to 2. So we are supposed to calculate the value of the tangent line. Good. So now we are going to put a couple of concepts together and we are going to go back into our uh, pre-calculus as well and grab a formula right which you oh actually no not yet that's that's next let's let's first do this uh, the old-fashioned way so what do i have here i have f of x i have f of a and i have x minus a this is my a this two that's my a so to find m tangent What I need to do is to calculate the limit x goes to a, which is 2, of f of x 
that's x squared minus 3x plus 1. minus f of a and that that's going to give us what f of a is going to be 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 1 divided by x minus 2. Now we can't just compute this because if I plug in x equals 2 we get the 0 in the denominator and the, the whole thing blows up. So let's go and take a look at algebra that we can perform here. So I have x squared minus 3x plus 1 minus, and in parentheses I have 4 minus 6 plus 1, x minus 2. So we're just following calculation here. And that gives me x squared minus 3x plus 1 minus this is going to be negative 1, so plus 1, divided by x minus 2. Is this good? 4 minus 6 is negative 2, and plus 1. All right, cool. So now, what I want to do here is I want to uh, solve this, right, going, uh, going through whatever hoops I can using, you know, we are now, uh, after you guys, after you place this line, you're done with your chapter 3. All of this is solving limits from chapter 2. I mean, this question would be perfectly valid to ask on an exam, let's say, next week, without mentioning the word slope, because I can just give this. That's a limit question. It's not a chapter 3 question. It's a limit question from chapter 2, and you're just supposed to solve it with any means from chapter 2. And you have the graph, the chart, the uh, algebra, and plug-in, and all of these methods, right? So now what I have here is um, the next step is the limit. X goes to 2. Uh, let me just put this step here. Uh, simplifying this as x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x minus 2. Now I am going to um, factor, right? That's our method. Um, so that's x minus 2, x minus 1. And then I have x minus 2 in the denominator. These guys drop and I have a limit. x goes to 2 right, for x minus 1, and now we can just plug in because there's no more denominator, no more zeros, 2 minus 1 is equal to 1. So m tangent is equal to 1. So this is the calculation, and we are going to say, well, can we make this a little bit better, right? Can we make this a little bit better? Because um, this might be, you know, too much when the functions are not polynomials, right? Exponential, logarithmic, trigonometric functions, radical, rational, absolute value, composite functions, they all go into this mess, right? So computing the tangent line slope right, the slope of the tangent line, is not very pleasant calculation if you have uh, this formula. So let's make it better and link it to something you learned in pre-calc 1 and probably choose to forget, chose to forget, or you maybe never learned it. You just did the two homework examples and one on the lab and you never went back because you never asked, why are we learning this? That's the, always the question that you should have in your mind. Exams and grades are pointless. It's all garbage. What you need is the knowledge so that you can actually build things, so you can understand the concepts and, and, and be able, so why are you learning something? Why? So here we go. M tangent was given as the limit x goes to a 
of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, say, uh, can I can I do better here? Let me let me make zero in the limit at least. So I'm going to subtract a on both sides, and that will give me x minus a goes to zero. Now we don't like this x minus a. So this x minus a we are going to define as age. That's what uh, that's the letter that it's generally used. So x minus a, which is the substitution we are going to use everywhere, and that makes now this whole situation age goes to zero, right? Because when you replace this with age, it will be age goes to zero. And now. I'm going to go and replace uh, this everywhere, right? Then I can replace it. I can replace it here and get age, right? And uh, I can go and say that uh, this x from here, x is equal to a plus age, and then that can be stuffed in here. So with this transformation, I get that the m tangent is equal to a limit h goes to zero. And then I have my f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. That seems like it has less calculations. Awesome. And I'm going to keep that for now. So I'm going to keep this as my formula. You have seen this formula in pre-calc 1 without the limit. Limit was not there, right? You have seen this. And if you know its name and you know how to compute it, well, you really paid attention and you really cared. Because, as I said, it was a minor thing for you to practice in the section, pre-calc 1, in the section when it's compositional functions. And you just exercise examples. But now, with the limit in front of it, all of a sudden it becomes the most important concept of Calculus 1. Huh. This is why you should never on your own decide what's important and what's not important in the math class, <laughs> right? I mean, you should learn everything because obviously everything is used eventually. But such a trivial example, right, in your pre-calc 1 turns out to be the most important thing uh, later on. Anyway, we are going to now solve the same problem from above using this formula and get the same one. So that's x squared minus 3x plus 1. At x equals to 2. Again, that's your a. <coughs> now, you, this formula, for those of you that don't remember pre-calc 1, is called difference quotient. And yes, Great, great job! I see it in in YouTube chat. Uh, uh, in YouTube chat, typed in. Perfect. Uh, it is uh, difference quotient, and uh, we, as you can see, use it to compute the slope of the tangent line, which gives us that instantaneous change. It's amazing. All right. So what I what do I do here? Well, I have a couple of these things that I have to compute. Um, I need f of a, that's the easy one, that's 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 1, we said that was uh, uh, negative 1 before, and then I need f of a plus h, which is f of 2 plus h, which means that every x of a function is replaced by 2 plus h. So, 
I have 2 plus h squared minus 3 times 2 plus h plus 1. So that's the basics of function composition. That gives us 4 plus 4h plus h squared minus 6 minus 3h plus 1. And I do the h square, common right, like terms. Then I have 4h, 3h is just plus single h. And finally, the numbers 4 minus 6 is negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. And now we take all of these concepts and plug them into our difference quotient for m tangent. So first I have the one, uh, f of, uh, well, first we have the limit. You have to write that in every step. h goes to 0. Then you have your f of a, uh, a plus h, that's h squared plus h minus 1 minus f of a divided by h. This turns into limit h goes to 0 of h squared plus h over h. Those ones canceled. And now I need to uh, just factor that h to cancel the denominator h. So h, h plus 1 divided by h. These guys cancel, and there you go. When you plug now h equal to 0, as h goes to 0, you just have 1 left over, which is the slope that we uh, had before, right? The slope was 1 in, the, in our first calculation, uh, which was a little bit longer and, uh, you know, more work um, than, than this one. Good. I'm still, uh, you know, I'm always looking for questions. You should ask a question anytime you feel that you need to ask a question and you have the choices of uh, typing in chat in YouTube or using voice through, through Zoom. So um, please uh, do not hesitate. And uh, especially because we are going through the especially that we are going through the concept that it's the most important concept uh, for the semester so if you if you have any problems issues or so on make sure you are asking those questions i want to recap now uh, this and then push the same problem further we were able to transform our m tangent into a more useful formula and somewhat shorten our calculations to obtain the same answer for uh, x equal to 2. Well, now my question is, what is the slope of tangent line at, at 6? Is it the same value? And the answer is no. We have to recompute everything from scratch. So if I am to take this problem here, right, and copy it here, and say, what if I have a 6 now instead of 2? What now? The answer is, do everything from scratch. We have to get f of a, which is f of 6, which is going to be 36 minus 18 plus 1 which is going to be 19. Then we have to get f of 6 plus h, which is 
6 plus age squared minus 3 times 6 plus age plus 1. And we have to work that one out. That's going to be 36 plus 12 age plus age squared. Don't forget the middle term when you're squaring this. That's the biggest noob move on the on the test and, and cost points. So get that uh, square of the binomial uh, straightened out from algebra. So the middle term over here, what I call the, the grade slayer, minus 18 minus 3 age plus 1. And then work that out. We have age squared. 12 minus 3 is plus 9 age. And uh, 36 minus 10 is plus 8, 19. 19. There we go. We have to plug all of this in the m tangent formula. Limit, age goes to zero, and then we have age squared plus nine age plus nineteen minus nineteen for minus f of a divided by age. Nineteens will cancel, and you are free to factor out age. That is very important. You always need to be able to factor out age in one of the steps so that you can cancel it with the age that it's a problem age from the denominator, right? Because that one is zero. So this has to be canceled. And when you, when you do that, you are going to uh, now have the limit age goes to zero of age plus nine, which gives you nine. So M tangent is equal to 9. What you have is the slope of that red line, the tangent line, which measures instantaneous change. That means that at that point, something is changing 9 units in time. Are you using, uh, are you, are you, I don't know, uh, using, uh, sorry, losing uh, nine grams of mass in that in that split second, or you are gaining or losing nine dollars because investment is changing, stock market, right? The production. Talk about business and economics. Production. You are. Uh, having a, a $9 per unit of the cost. We'll see all of these examples later on of how this stuff is used. And it can be a nine, nine miles per hour, your, your running speed um, on, uh, let's say, during the marathon. Uh, this number nine is going to measure a lot of the application around us. And we need to know how to obtain that number. That number is going to be the central focus of Calculus 1 because it will give you the answers for what you are looking for in the framework of a system that is changing, evolving, moving, right? That's, that's the idea. Now, if, I, if I'm going to show up and say, uh, I really didn't want 6, uh, how about negative 3? You have to redo the entire problem again. Negative 3 goes into all of these mixes here and negative 3, and then you go and calculate and so on. And then I say, well, I didn't really want negative 3. I actually wanted, you know, negative 25. It becomes problematic to redo the problem every time you need a different slope to observe the phenomenon that you are observing and studying. So 
we say, you know what? Let's for the last time make this formula better. Let us write the, the final stage of the formula where I get rid of this particular value A and replace it with X because if I am able to solve this problem for X, then I solve this problem for all X equals A values and I don't have to recompute every time when my value changes because I will have one answer and then I can just plug in A into that answer because the answer will be in terms of X. So let's, let's, let's check that. So I'm just going to write now old M tangent equals limit H goes to zero of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. And now I say m tangent is equal to the limit h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And here I reach the final stage of development of the formula which we were discussing i don't know how to make this more ridiculous but we are we are finally there and if you want to make it more ridiculous there's a rainbow pen option yes thank you the suggestion was to use the rainbow. Yes, there we go. Is this good? Is this is this uh, absolutely perfect? You were approved. Thank you. All right, great. I'm I'm losing patience as we're going there, but that's ah, excellent. There we go. <laughs> It looks like a two-year-old did it, but it's amazing. All right. Now I get to welcome you to Calculus 1 officially because we have developed the formula that can compute instantaneous rate of change for all values, for all values. And the first example is our good example of... 3x, no. I already forgot. x squared minus 3x plus 1. x squared minus 3x plus 1. And at this time, you are not given a point because you are going to compute this for all values. And then if someone gives you a point, you're just going to plug it in. So, we need f of x plus h which means that every x will be replaced by x plus h. We'll work out that algebra, giving us x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h plus 1. And as you can see, there is nothing you can combine there. It's just a mess. And now you plug that mess in there. You plug your function in there. And you just solve the algebra. Emphasis on the word just. <laughs> M tangent is the limit. H goes to zero. Have this mess x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h plus 1 minus the original function f of x divided by h. Limit h goes to 0. 
note that x squared is gone because x squared minus x squared. Then minus 3x minus and minus make a plus, so that's gone. And 1 and 1 are gone because of this minus, right, becomes a minus 1. So there we go. And we get 2xh plus h squared minus 3h over h. If you carefully look at the problem, after cancellation, after the purge, right, the only terms remaining are the ones with age. And you can factor age and cancel the age in denominator. So limit age goes to zero is 2x, oops, sorry, kick the age out first, and then 2x plus age minus 3 divided by age. Well, that's gone. And we are left with the limit age goes to zero of 2x plus age minus 3. There is no more denominator. There is no more zero. Now we have just a good old regular expression which age goes to zero, age is gone, and just have 2x minus 3. So we got a function now. Earlier, when we were computing at the particular point, we were getting particular answers, which were the slopes. Now, instead of getting particular answer, right, we had, I believe, two, we had the one, and then we had nine. Now, instead of getting one and nine, you are getting 2x minus three. So, what I want to do now is I want to check the tangent line, nah, slope, not the tangent line yet. M tangent, thank you, at x equals to 2. Well, plug in 2 in there, you get 2 times 2 minus 3 is 4 minus 3, which is 1. That's what we had before. How about if x is equal to 6? Well, we said 2 times 6 minus 3 was 12 minus 3 is 9. So now I do not have to recompute the entire process, right? Uh, the entire uh, problem every time when you switch the value x, right? I have this, which will generate all of the slopes as soon as I plug in the point of interest, right? A is equal to 2, A is equal to 6, or I mentioned negative 1. That's not a problem. Slope is negative 5. Remember I said also negative 25? It's okay. Negative 53. It's easy. Now it becomes easy. So we do one calculation, and at the end, we come up with this function, which will generate all of the slopes. Uh, so now, what is this function? It has a special name. It has a special name in the title of the today's lecture. So this particular function here is called the derivative. And that function, as you can see, generates all slopes of the tangent line for a given function f of x. So the derivative, also known as f prime of x, is the function. which generates, computes, whatever, computes all m tangent, which is slopes of the tangent line, for given f of x. 
if you really want to understand what the derivative is, I gotta use this rainbow more. Awesome. <laughs> uh. Gonna write the whole lecture in, <laughs> in this, looks like use the crayon. Anyway. Um and now for the for the last time, right? Welcome to calculus. So the concept of the derivative is um, never going to leave your math career from now on. Uh, it should be used in physics, should be used in all of your engineering courses, uh, especially if you're going to have, um, let's say, a dynamics course. It's going to be a lot of derivatives and integrals in there as well. Um, this is used a lot. And derivative measures the change. And that's why it's used so much. Derivative measures the change. Why is it measuring the change? Because it's a slope of the tangent line, right? It measures instantaneous change. The slope measures the change. Um, you, can, you can always say it changed this much in this time. So, if you want to understand what 60 miles per hour means, you can't if you write it in this garbage way. But if you say 60 miles per one hour, this speed now makes a lot of sense. This says that in a span of one hour of driving or flying or, or swimming, you are going to cover... 60 miles that's what 60 miles per hour means now when you say it so fast 60 miles per hour or even worse 60 mph it doesn't have much of the meaning until you really stop for a second and think about it 60 miles covered in one hour that means also that you are covering 60 miles in 60 minutes, which means that you are covering one mile in one minute. All your driving experience just improved drastically because if you want to go to a 300 mile trip, right, you could be, right, if you want to go to a, a 300 mile trip, you can say it will take me roughly 300 minutes, right? Now, the speed limit is going to be higher than 60, but then there are going to be maybe uh, some parts with a lot of stop signs, red lights, or whatever, and then you're going to have maybe a traffic slowdown, an accident somewhere, not you, but accident was on the road, and then you're stuck in traffic, and so on. So it all averages out to a 60, but in 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 all fairness, that's 60 miles per hour. Now, when you look at your speedometer, that's the derivative which says you are currently covering 60 miles in one hour at the speed you are going at. What is the speed of 60 miles per hour? It's when I say speed, then you immediately go change in the distance over change in time. So, um, <coughs> we are now understanding that the speed is actually change of distance in time. If you have zero speed, 
you are not getting anywhere because you are not covering any distance in time. If I say that my speed is zero, then my number, see, if this is zero, this must be zero. You can't have time to be zero, right? So if, the, if this is zero, then the distance covered is zero. So if you are sitting on the chair, right, relative to the surface of the planet, you are not moving, you are not going anywhere, right? You are not going anywhere because, right, the change in distance is not happening. You are not covering the distance from point A to point B. Now, if you start covering the distance from point A to point B, that is immediately going to be the B minus A situation, right? So you are having something that would go on top, and then you're also going to have time 2 minus time 1 to go on the bottom because it takes time. Even if, we, if when we figure out teleportation for, for humans, currently we can only teleport particles uh, in the current state of technology, but once the teleportation is ready for humans and large objects to be uh, teleported, it's still not going to be uh, instantaneous travel because it has to be done at the speed of light and speed of light still covers distance in time. See, what is the one light year? One light year is a measure for distance that the light beam covers in one year of Earth's time. So it is not a universal measure in the universe because we measure that distance in the um, uh, in respect to how long uh, it takes Earth to go once around the Sun. So it's kind of lousy measurement, right? That any other alien species, right? Any any other species than human species uh, from the universe would not take as a measurement because why would they care, right? How fast the Earth goes around the the, the sun. But the light year as a as a measurement is still going to be how far a beam of light goes in the unit of time, which is a year. So light year, that's the distance. Now, teleportation is going to be transferred through as fast as that, the speed of light. So you're still going to have the denominator, which will be some kind of, speed, uh, some kind of a, a time uh, delay, and obviously the distance to which you are teleporting. So you can still calculate the speed of teleportation, right? Because it will be the distance you teleport the unit to divided by, let's say it's at speed of light, divided by the speed of light, which is a number that you can that you can write down and, and use in computation. So what we learned now is that the derivative is going to be a key player in measuring all of these things. It measures the angular speed and angular velocity, angular acceleration. Your acceleration is change in speed. Think about that. You have two pedals in a car. If you have three pedals, please update the car. I mean, people are driving electric vehicles uh, already, and, and, and we have some people driving cars with three pedals. I mean, come on. Um, so we have two pedals in a car. Both of those pedals are the acceleration. It's just acceleration in a different direction, right? You have... A gas and the brake, and I don't care which one you which one you uh, are thinking of. They both change your speed. So acceleration is change of speed, better velocity, but okay, speed in change of time and you have this change of time as a very important uh, number when you're talking about specs of a vehicle 
what is Tesla saying? We have the fastest car in the galaxy, right? Because we can do 0 to 60 in 2 seconds, right? 2.1, 2.3, whatever the hell is there when you push that when you push that button. So it is not going to be 0 to sec 0 to 60 in 0 0 time. I don't care what kind of engineering Tesla pulls off, right? They're not going to get it to be 0 to 60 in 0 seconds. So you think for a car to go 60 and it's instantly there. No, absolutely not. Even though your thought takes time. Those are insanely small fractions of a second, but still takes time for you to think it. So there's your leg right there. Acceleration 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. Awesome. Like 17 seconds for Prius. So you, you have... You have the change of speed happens gradually. You're at the red light. You push the gas pedal. It's going to take a couple of seconds until you're going 50, 60, or so on. Brakes, same way. They also change speed, but they change speed down, right? They change a different direction then. So you are decelerating, and it's also change of speed because when you press the brakes, you go from 60 down to 50 to 40 to 30 right and, and eventually stop the idea of the speed limit is uh, there uh, to give you uh, enough time for the driving and road conditions to stop your vehicle if you if you need to clearly highway no traffic no traffic lights and and so on yes you do have idiots driving but uh, in some case but Usually you can go around them, but the, the thing is that you can have a higher speed limit on a highway because you are not expecting red lights, you are not expecting uh, those interruptions in driving, but again, you're going to have a deer, you're going to have debris uh, on the road from blown tires uh, from trucks, you are going to have potholes, you are going to have all of these things that could happen on the, on the highway. Right, you're going to have those things. Speed limit is 65, but then when you are in a residential neighborhood and the speed limit is 25, well, that's where the kid can run out on the street, right, chasing a ball, you know, a, a four year old. And if you're driving 65, you do not have time to stop because braking is change of speed in time. And depending on how good your tires are, how good your brakes are. Right, and how good the whole engineering around brakes is, right? You are going to take more or less time to stop. So we have speed limits 25, 30, 35, 40, right? And then on some highways, you have 75. Now, if you go to Germany on Autobahn, there is no speed limit. They say drive whatever you want. So technically, the speed would be right the max speed of the car, but turns out that. They're a little bit more <laughs> population-wise dungeon than we are, so they're not dying by thousands every every week, um, even though they have no speed limit. It's a cultural thing. So that's the idea of the derivative. See, the derivative, and now I can say acceleration A is... I'll, I'm introducing new notation now. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, derivative of the velocity which is change in velocity over derivative in time change in time and we call the whole thing the derivative so now let's talk notation what are the proper ways to write the derivative uh, this is very long introductory lecture which is why we're going to have a break uh, right after this one uh, it's very important to learn these basic concepts so you can perform uh, the rest of the course and future courses. It's very important to understand what these concepts actually mean rather than just how to compute it. Notation. So, notation for derivative, we have many. So, derivative of, derivative of, f of x 
of y equal f of x, yeah, whatever. You can write this as y prime, y with a dot on top. That's the original Newton notation. Very few people use it right now. You can write it as f prime of x. You can write it as, and different courses will also have different stuff. Uh, the, the best one, Leibniz notation, dy over dx, then d dx of f of x, then dx of f of x, also fx in calculus 3, fx pops out. All of these mean the same thing, derivative of f of x. In this course, calculus 1, we are going to see, let's use the rainbow, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So those are the four that you are going to see in this class. Now, 90% of the time, I use this because I said I love that one the most because it shows most of the stuff. And I'll, I will explain that when we, when we need to. Right now, we don't need to explain why is this the best notation in, in my never humble opinion. But we are going to use the other three as well. This one you're going to run into differenti in differential equations and linear algebra. This one you're going to run into calc 3. And as I said, Newton's notation uh, is going to be, I've seen it only once in course of, you know, 20 years of education. And there was a professor of engineering uh, who was really old school. And all of his uh, notation was using the original Newton because probably his education uh, introduced that notation and he never changed it to what we use now. Anyway, but I don't want you to get confused if you go to your four-year school and all of a sudden your professor, you know, uses that with a dot. It's the same as the, it's just a derivative. So now we understand what the derivative is and um, we are going to compute um, uh, we have to do two more, uh, well, one more concept, which is the tangent line, which is algebra. We're done with calculus. But I want to compute one more example to show um, one more calculation. So find the derivative for f of x equals um, I don't know, 6 over x, right? And now we just say, oh, okay, I know, I know how to do this, right? It's the limit, or you can say f prime of x, or whatever notation, is going to be given as a limit, h goes to 0, of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So I already have f of x. I need f of x plus h. Well, that's going to be easy. Awesome. And now I just need to plug everything in, massage it with algebra to get the, the derivative. All right, let's go. Limit, h goes to 0. I have 6 over x plus h minus 6 over x divided by h. Now some of you are going to go, ah, oh, that's why in algebra we had the complex rational, ex simplifying complex rational expression sections in, in elementary and intermediate. Yes, because of this and many other examples down calculus that you are going to do with double fractions and algebra. All right, so deal with this in any way you know. Calculus is over right here. 
right? So, so this is your this is your calculus, and we're done with calculus. Now, basic algebra to solve this. That's all it is. Now, to to the uh, the <laughs> heresy. <laughs> okay, I was about to say witchcraft, but <laughs> but since you said heresy, okay, now let's deal with this heresy uh, by um, subtracting the fractions on top first, right? So common denominator, so that's going to be x and x over here, and x plus h on this side, uh, to give us um, the 6x minus 6x minus 6h divided by x, x plus h, everything divided by h over 1. I'm going to put that there so I have a double fraction so I can Cancel later. So now uh, cancel this 6x. I forgot to close the parentheses over here. There we go. This is equal to limit h goes to 0. And uh, now uh, multiply 2 that are far apart and multiply 2 that are close by, right? So, or you can write it as division, then flip the second fraction, just whatever method you know. This is going to be negative 6h divided by uh, x h x plus h so when you multiply the two that are in the middle this h right goes in there now that h cancels get out of here and you are left with <coughs> limit h goes to zero of negative six over x x plus h now, when h goes to 0, you are left with negative 6 over x squared. So, the derivative is negative 6 over x squared. That's the answer. Now, if I want to know the tangent line at 3, I just plug 3 in, becomes negative 6 over 9, negative 2 thirds. If I want to know what's the derivative at uh, 1, the slope of the tangent line at 1, I plug in 1 into the derivative, I get negative 6 over 1, negative 6. So we find the function which generates all of those slopes, and those slopes are the numbers which represent the change at that, that location. The final concept which I wanted to talk about in this lecture is actually the entire tangent line, which is just more algebra. So I'm going to expand this problem now and say find the tangent line at x equals 4, whatever, for f of x equals 6 over x, right? So, okay, the tangent line. An hour ago, I said tangent line is a linear line, blah, 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 blah. Oh, tangent line is a linear line. That means y equal mx plus b. So, tangent line must be of the form y equal mx plus b. Tattoo this on your arm. Okay? Not on the forehead, because you can only see it when you look at the mirror. Uh, tattoo this, you know, on your arm, so you, you can see it every time you, you, you lift your arm. At one point, a couple of years back, a student was arguing, well, you said you give partial credit, but I, I scored zero on the tangent line problem, and I calculated everything except blah, blah, blah. And I said, do you see that your tangent line has x squared in it? Yeah, but that's the only mistake. That's missing the concept to the point where you wanted to send people to, the, to Mars 
and you missed Mars, and they floated off into and crashed into Saturn. All right, that's how terrible the the, the situation is. All right, tangent line is defined as a linear line. If you have anything else other than than this form, it could be y equals three. That's a horizontal line, right? y equals three is a horizontal line. Fine. You can have x plus 7. That's a linear line. But if you put in any e inside, like e to the x, exponential, logarithmic, trigonometric, that just says that you have no concept of what the hell is going on in the course. Tangent line is a linear line, and your answer must be linear line. So I'm asking now to find the linear line that goes through number four with a slope which we just computed all right so what do i need now this one over here is going to be your m tangent i have to get that one first m tangent is the derivative computed at four because we know that the function we obtained before is the derivative Plugging numbers into derivative will give you the slope of the tangent line. Awesome. Negative 6 over 4 squared, negative 6 over 16. I almost wrote 12. And um, now... Wait, why, uh, why 4 squared? f of x is just x, or a 6x over x. You see my... Oh, okay, okay, I see. <laughs> Good. So... The tangent line, slope of the tangent line is computed in the derivative. Because that's what the derivative gives, slopes of the tangent line. And I want to find that there. So slope of the tangent line. And, and thank you for asking. That's, that's really important to, to clear up as soon as possible. Uh, divide by 2, we get negative 3 over 8. So my slope for the problem is that. I have x, x is 4, and now I need y. y is f of 4. This is the time where you guys go, oh, okay. When I'm calculating slope, I'm using derivative. When I'm calculating y value, I'm using original function. And I'm going to pause to, for that to sink in. When I'm calculating the slope, I'm using the derivative. When I'm calculating the y value, I'm using the function because plugging x in a function gives us y. All right, so now that's going to be um, 6 over 4. And that's 3 halves. That's 3 halves. And uh, yeah, that's 3 halves. So, now I have all of the things to plug into y equal mx plus b and to find the linear line, which is called the tangent line. Uh, 3 halves is equal to negative 3 eighths times 4 plus b. That's 3 halves equal to, uh, these guys cancel, negative 3 halves plus b. b equals to 3 halves plus 3 halves is 6 halves, which is 3. And your tangent line at x equals to 4 is y equals negative 3 eighths x plus 3. This was all algebra. I did not do any calculus to find the tangent line. I know the formula for the linear line. I know x, y, and m. I plug those to find b, and then I plug slope and a b in the formula to come up with a tangent line. If you are to say, well, okay, but what is it used for? We are ending the course with one picture. 
and in two minutes it's break. Here is a curve of the road, right? It's a curve. It's a road. Here's the car. And here is the IC patch. Cover with leaves and spilled oil. So you're guaranteed to go off the road. Once the car hits this patch and loses the traction, the friction between tires and the road, it's the only thing that keeps you on a road. Bad tires pretty much mean certain death, okay? The car is able to drive because there is grip between the tires and the road. When you lose that grip, the car will tangentially go off the road in a direction. So if the car got there and with the speed lost control, the car will tangentially shoot straight, which is the tangent line, and you can compute the trajectory. The same thing for derailed roller coaster. If derails, let's say here, the tangent line will shoot it like a cannon that way. All right. So there's the tangent line. It shows the velocity uh, and the distance um, and speed, right? So many other examples, obviously, particle accelerator, it's like thousands and thousands of examples, but these are the ones that you understand the fastest because they're, they're grim and terrible. We are going to take break all the way till 11 now. Bye.